the number one thing that women need to do in midlife to prepare for the rest of life is to stop worshiping our youth. Today, I'm going to share with you my conversation with Dr. Vonda Wright. She is an orthopedic surgeon and she is a midlife mobility doctor. She's super incredible, you guys. If you are not following her, I'm going to put all of her socials down below. She is an author. Like I said, she's an orthopedic surgeon. She is a women's advocate. She's just amazing. Now, we did this over Zoom, so please forgive the quality. I'm going to work on that. But the information itself is golden as far as I'm concerned. We are going to keep this menopause discussion going. Do check down below in the description box because if you do not have a doctor who will listen to you about your perimenopausal symptoms, menopausal symptoms, postmenopausal symptoms, if they have poo-pooed you, if they've turned you away, if they've just, you know, like the conversation, then there are online resources now where you can at least get education, you can learn about your options, and now you can also get medications over online and you have a doctor the whole time. So you actually have a menopause specialist who can help you. So I'm gonna link that down below. It is Alloy and I absolutely love them. I get things from Alloy. I am a customer of theirs. I just definitely want you to know that you have options. I'm gonna roll the footage from my discussion with Dr. Wright. I hope you're having a fantastic day and I'll see you on the other side. Well, I'm so excited to be with you today. I think a lot of people know me from what I talk about online, but what people might not know is that um, I am the mother of a blended family of six children that that age in, that range in age from 35 to 16. And yes, it was a really busy household. And my husband, uh, who is a two-time Stanley Cup champion, he's a professional hockey player, and I have built this really dynamic group of amazing people that we live with that and we have our first grandson. So that's a side of me I don't talk about much, but I do come at the things I say and the advice I give from that perspective as a mother, as a stepmother, as a now a grandmother. But my first career in medicine was as a cancer nurse. So imagine coming straight out of college, I had a degree in biology in the United States, there was such a, a shortage of nurses at that time that if you had a solid degree, you could immediately train as a nurse. So in the next three years, I got another bachelor's degree and a master's degree in cancer nursing and, and started treating women in the fight for their lives. And back 30 years ago when this was, we, our, our remedies for that kind of devastating illness were not as good as they are now. So women would be in the hospital for a whole week getting their chemotherapy, one week, a month for six months. So you can envision the deep relationships, therapeutic relationships I would form with these women and their families. So I, I, and imagine being 23 when you're surrounded by grown women in the fight of their life. So I came away from that with a real sense of what mattered to me. Those women just taught me that at the end of the day, what I need to focus on. So in my own house pen, if you ever come and visit me, I am only the second owner of this house, but it's the other lady's curtains, right? She did a great job. I don't need to remodel, blah, blah, blah. So it, so that just gives people another flavor besides the mother of everything and then the, the caretaker cancer nurse. But now I'm an orthopedic sports surgeon. And so I take care of athletes and active people of all ages and skill levels, really driven by the knowledge that when I save your mobility, I am gonna save you from the ravages of chronic disease. So for me, it's not just the technical skill that these hands are capable of. For me, it is a lifetime of health, dying, healthy, vital, active, joyful, not decrepit, a shadow of our former selves laying in a hospital bed. So that's where all of this comes from. So tell me in that in that vein, what are some actionable things that uh, women, in particular, let's talk about women in midlife, what are some things that they can do to live happy, vital, strong into old age? What, what are some things that they can do now? Well, the first thing I'm going to say to you might be surprising because I'm going to get to number two, three, and four. But the first thing we need to do in order to 
live the life we envision long into the foreseeable future is recognize that even I'm 57, even at 57, I have only lived half of my adult life. If I think I became an adult at 17 ish, mm -hmm. 40 years is my first adulthood. But here's the deal I'm about to say to you. The number one thing that women need to do in midlife to prepare for the rest of life is to stop worshiping our youth. Mm -hmm. We need to stop looking. I always look over my left shoulder. Stop looking back to saying, oh my God, 25 was so amazing. And maybe in terms of easiness and physical easiness, it was amazing, right? You could do almost anything and bounce back. But you weren't established in your job. You weren't, many people were still living with their families. We hadn't earned enough money to be even remotely independent. And I contend to you, you do not fully know yourself and become settled in your heart and soul of who you are until you have aged enough to live the experience. So in order to be the best going forward and to do the other things I'm about to tell you to do, you have to pivot your mindset from worshiping that to anticipating this, right? You can remember the great things, but we're not living back there. We're living forward. So what do we do when we go forward? Well, if you have one thing to do, if you have one hour a day and nothing else to do, you are going to lift weights because by building lean muscle mass, you are going to build a better brain. I, we can talk about the science of that. You are going to prevent frailty, prevent breaking a bone that will take away your independence. It will keep you out of pain, right? Because some of the biggest things that people fear with growing older is loss of independence, living in pain, having a bunch of diagnoses that keep you in your doctor's office three times a week. So the, if you only have one hour, you are going to lift heavy weights. The second thing that people, women in midlife can do is do the hard work of making a decision about whether hormone therapy is right for you. Do not just take the advice of the tabloid new papers. Do not just take the advice even of the menopause. Like me, it's a bunch of doctors. This is what we call ourselves, the menopause. Do mm -hmm. not um, just be motivated by the fear of someone in your neighborhood saying, oh my God, my aunt Gertie got breast cancer from hormones. I'm not going to do it. If that's, if you ultimately decide not to do hormones, that's fine with me. We are all sentient beings. We're mature women. You have agency to decide. But what I insist on is that you surround yourself with science. Mm -hmm. And so the, the way that I did that is I read I listened to Estrogen Matters, the book by Avram Bloomy and Carol Tavares. And then I had to buy the book and underline it mm -hmm. and, and really understand the data. That's how you're going to make a decision because I don't take HT myself for hot flashes, night sweats, um, and a variety of other word finding things. I take it because it's going to prevent me from losing my bone density and fracturing. It's going to help me build a muscle. It's going to retain my brain. Lisa Moscone just came out with her amazing book documenting that. And it's going to prevent heart disease. The four things that kill women, I'm preventing. But it's everybody's choice, right? So we're going to pivot our mindsets. We're going to lift heavy. We're going to consider HT. And then we're going to live an anti-inflammatory lifestyle which to me means green leafy vegetables, lean protein. I don't care whether it comes from animal or vegetable. You just need to get one gram per ideal pound. But here's the thing that everybody hates when I say it. We are going to stop eating sugar because sugar is going to cook us from the inside out. And from a beauty perspective, it's going to wrinkle us all like crazy. And who wants that? I don't. I'm as, Listen, I'm concerned. So I do all those things. And uh, those are the four things. We can layer on all kinds of things, right? I mean, for instance, I do all those things. They're a lifestyle. So now once that I've got that down, it takes me no extra time. This year, I'm layering on um, a sauna because I'm going to build some heat shock proteins and I'm all the other stuff. But I think sometimes people try to start with too many things at once and they get nothing done. Is there any way to rebuild bone in the cervical spine 
50 year old postmenopause. So that's a lot of uh, ladies out there. And um, is there any hope to prevent more bone deterioration or things that can be done to prevent more loss? So let's talk about bone health in general. Um, and I'm going to talk about this question, but then I'm going to talk about our daughters, okay. in, our daughters in general, uh, mm -hmm. not mine or yours specifically, but the younger women. Can you rebuild or maintain bone? And the answer to that is yes. Sometimes it's hard. So the first thing women need to do, if they have any of the 13 risk factors that I've talked about on in my Instagram page in the last couple of days, including being female, being Caucasian or Asian, um, having a fair complexion, uh, having medical illnesses such as autoimmune disease, high levels of historically taking prednisone, in your past, smoking, drinking, that there's there's a lot of risk factors. And now today I posted that even Prilosec, anything that stops GI mm -hmm. absorption can affect your bones. If you have those risk factors, plus or minus a family history, meaning just look at your mother. Is mm -hmm. she shrinking? Did mm -hmm. she, my mother used to be 5'4". Now she's about down here to me. She's shrinking. That's because her spine is compressing. If your mother is shrinking, all of those risk factors, you go get a DEXA scan. I just did. Good for you. I'm so glad. Yeah. Did you have to fight for it or did your doctor say, sure, go get it? Well, no, actually it's funny because I went to a place in New York city that I saw you were following. <laughs> I'm like, well, oh, Dr. Wright is just following them on Instagram. I'm going to go ahead and make an appointment there. And we filmed it and everything. And my plan is actually, to, I did this after the Pause Life Cruise. I, my plan is to go back in a year and I'm lifting heavy. Thank you very much. Doing all kinds of things that I think should help. And, you know, it's just a, it's for me, it's just a little measure whether or not it changes. I realize there's all kinds of factors and stuff, but I thought it's motivation. If nothing else, it's motivation. Oh, it's, it's critical because when I tell you to lift heavy, it's as heavy as your bones can bear. Right. So number one, go get a DEXA scan. And, and in the United States, at least insurance will say, we will not pay for it unless you're 65. And to which I say, ladies, skip the handbag this month and go get yourself yeah. a DEXA scan or skip the, my Starbucks drink costs seven hundred seven dollars and 18 cents. I don't do that anymore. Save your, save your month, your morning $10 coffee and buy your bones some DEXA scan. Just get one. So we know where we are. Number one, number two. Okay. Here are the things that build better bone impact exercise, like jumping, jumping up and down 20 times a day creates a mechanical force that builds bone. Uh, number two, vibratory plates. Number three, even the astronauts coming back from space, jump on, jump up and down on a trampoline. It's called rebounding, which can help lift heavy weights. Mm -hmm. Bone and muscle are one unit, actually. They mm -hmm. function as a unit. So building muscle will pull on the bones and build bones. Um, high protein diet, vitamin D, magnesium. You know, I wish there was solid data on collagen. I wish I could say, buy this brand. It's going to build your bones. There, There's very small studies on certain collagen brands. So here's how I tell my patients. It's unlikely to hurt you. So go ahead if you would like to take collagen. Um, and then if your DEXA scan is very, very low, minus 3.5 or minus 2.5, then do consider with your endocrinologist whether your risk is high enough that you should go on a medication. Because here's the deal. Women who break their hips, 70% of all hip fractures are in women. One in three women will have an osteopenic fracture in their lifetime. Women who fall and break their hip 50% of the time, women and men, do not return to pre-fall function. And so you can't live in the house you're living in. You can't drive your car. You can't do anything you want to do when you want to do it. And personally, that will piss me off. 50% of us will not return. And... 30% of people die from complications of their osteoporotic fracture, not on my watch. So if we do not want in 20 years to 
subject ourselves to that kind of frailty and loss of independence, then it takes action today. But I do want to go back with that question and talk about the younger women that we know in our lives or might be listening and tell you that we lay down bone until we're 30. So you must do it now. You must jump up and down. You must impact your bones. You must do all the things I'm talking about because at 30, we don't lay down bone. But what if you're from 30 to 51 before estrogen clearly walks out the door? As long as you have estrogen, work hard at maintaining or building bone as much as you can because the estrogen is a, is a, cre uh, a, a key modulator of not not only bone density, but bone is a very dynamic structure. And every 10 years we replace our bone. So it has a critical role on the cell that breaks down bone called the osteoclast. So while you've got estrogen, build some bone. If you're in perimenopause, as I am, and let's say you're doing like the bridge HRT, you know, to go... Yeah. If I'm still on, let's say I decide to do um, HRT, which I am, I, I do decide to do HRT. Um, is is that still you, you have estrogen? I mean, into menopause, let's say you never stop. You always have estrogen. Are you talking yeah. about you have the estrogen that you're making or always? I mean, as long, if you're on HRT, oh. you, can still, you can be working your bones. Good question. Because we know that the the dose of bone it takes to protect them is actually pretty small. I I posted on that. I if I'm remembering correctly, it's point point oh two five, which is the lowest possible transdermal patch. So my my point of what I just said is between thirty and forty five. Before you enter perimenopause, you still have most of your estrogen every month. Capitalize on that. And then if you're transitioning and good for you that you're doing that, because there'll never be a gap, it takes a very low relative dose to protect your bones. So, because here's the data, once estrogen walks out the door, you'll lose two to 3% of your bone density a year. So if we wait until we're 65, when we finally get a DEXA scan, cat's out. The practitioner who went over the data from the DEXA scan, scan she said, we are marketing, if you will, to younger people, not because of business. I mean, I'm sure there's a that aspect. But sure, there said, is some business. Of course, of course. But really, because you, we want to get to these people early so that they are proactive versus being reactive when you have to try to make up lost ground. It's like, keep your ground, you know, going forward. It's interesting because somebody in the com in the questions here asked about um, collagen specifically and said she's more interested in her joints than she is her wrinkles. And I responded to her and said, me too, because, you know, vanity and all of that stuff. But <laughs> the older you get, the more you realize, I mean, we need our legs, we need our muscles, we need our joints a heck of a lot more than a fine line or wrinkle matters to us as we get older, you know? Okay. How often should we be getting bone scans? If we are already doing weight bearing exercise and getting enough calcium in our diet, this is from this person, not me. What more can we do to stave off osteoporosis? At what point is prescription medication recommended? I know we kind of went over this a little bit, but I do think there's a few things there that you might want to pull apart. I think all women, when you get your first mammogram, go get your first DEXA scan. I mean- so that's around 40, right? I mean, I, I also think if, if your doctor doesn't order a mammogram, you should go buy one yourself. I mean, I'm just, we buy, we buy what we want. If we want the healthcare we want, I'm a big proponent of, of paying for it. If we can, I know there are a lot of listeners that may not be able to, but we, we do what's important to us, right? And so get a baseline, especially if your mother is shrinking, especially if you have any of the risk factors that I laid out before, especially if you've ever smoked, not many women at this point in the country have ever smoked, but there remains some. It's, it's popular among college kids and teenagers. So uh, I know this from visiting colleges with my <laughs> children. So um, anyway, get a baseline at 40 and then, uh, See how you are. See if you laid down enough bone by the time you were 30. 
And then I would get one then um, as you start to lose your estrogen. Now, these are not national guidelines. This is how I would have done it had I known. But how I do it now, I get a baseline on all my women. If you have ever fallen, get a DEXA scan. You know, unless you've wrapped your car around a tree, falling and breaking a bone, you got to ask yourself, what's up with your bone? Fall, uh, fracture is the number one predictor of future fracture. So get a DEXA scan. And then definitely when you're in menopause, 52, get one to know where you are, right? Don't yeah. wait till you're 65. Do all the things we talked about with the supplements, with the, um, with the, building muscle mass with the jumping up and down with the vibratory plates. And then uh, if you, so how do we interpret DEXA scans? So normal is considered on one of those bell curves that we were graded on in college, straight up and down zero is a 30 year old woman's bone. Anything to the right of that, any positive number for bone density is fantastic. Mm -hmm. any number negative to minus one, a T-score of minus one is okay, but minus one because osteopenic, meaning weak bones. Minus 2.5 standard deviations from normal is osteoporotic. At negative 2.5 is when the medical literature suggests considering medical intervention in order to preventing further demineralization of your bone. Okay. Let's let's shift from bones to muscles, and yeah. I would love to hear the importance of protein. I know we talked about it. You said about how much, but why? Why? Because I actually think that so many people spend so much time trying to get thin that even if they're working out lifting, they don't understand the importance of protein. So I'd love to hear from you the importance of protein. Why? Well, I think culturally in this country, thin has always been the norm. I mean, look at the models in the seventies, like Twiggy, right? They were thin girls. I once was invited by Mercedes. Uh, and if I remember how I finagled this invitation, I would do it again. But anyway, Mercedes invited me to be their guest at New York Fashion Week. So I went and I was in all the tents and all the guest rooms. And it occurred to me as I was standing, there are runway models. And then there are these showcases where it's the models are just standing and you get to walk around them. It occur occurred to me that there were many, many, many young women who were thin like this, but had not one shred of muscle. So that's called thin fat. Yeah. What matters is your body composition, what your percentage body fat is, which you need fat to produce hormones and neural function. But to be 50% fat means you're still 50% fat, whether you're thin or considered obese, right? So uh, now the, I don't think we're quite there yet, but I hear it more and more that strong is the new thin. I would say for myself, I said this to my teenager the other day, I am interested in being lean. Mm -hmm. I don't actually really care what the scale says because I have the ab ability to do my body composition anytime I want it. And I want to know, what percentage fat I have and how much lean, how many pounds of lean muscle mass I have. Cause I want to be a lean flank steak and not a Colby beef because flank steak is strong and metabolically superior to a highly marbled weak, metabolically inferior muscle. So how do you get lean, healthy muscle? Well, you stress it out by lifting heavy, but once you stress it, how are you going to build it back. Well, you need to give it the protein that it needs to build back. And so most women believe the myth that we need to eat about a thousand calories a day. And in that many, many women, when you ask them to count their protein, including me, before I started counting, probably we're getting 60 to 90 grams a day, which is unless you weigh 90 pounds, half or, or three quarters of what you need. Because your body to stay alive will take what it needs. Mm -hmm. And if it needs protein to do a vital function, it's going to take it from your skeletal muscle, right? And you will get weaker and, and metabolize yourself, which that cannibalism sounds gruesome, but that's what happens. And so you need to give your body the building blocks. So high quality protein, pro, uh, protein with enough leucine, which your body doesn't make. And so... 
one gram per ideal pound a day is a little, it is a little conscientious to do. Like I aim for 130 grams a day. So every single meal has protein. I eat every day uh, a chicken breast the size of my hand, which has about 40 grams of protein. Or I just before I came on had a thing of tuna, which had 40 grams of protein. But you to get to 130 or to get to whatever your body weight is, you often need to supplement with protein. And so I use, uh, I've used several kinds of protein supplement. I use Clean Athlete, which I liked. My new favorite is Mind Body Greens, and they're not paying me to say this, but but they sent me some and it really is some of the best tasting I've ever had. Cause that's the problem with protein powders. They kind of taste like shoe leather, but it, so I just, and here's the thing I put it in water and I chug it. Cause listen, not everything we put in our mouths has to be a gourmet meal. I see it as fuel, not pleasure. I'm, I have a purpose, right? Some meals are pleasure, but these are just getting, the, the nutrients in. So that's how I do protein. I do want to ask you a little bit about sleep and how it relates to our bones and muscles, et cetera, and the importance of sleep. So, you know, when I was training as a surgical resident, um, I was so long ago, there were no work hour restrictions. Now young doctors are limited to 80 hours a week, which seems absurd, but that's an improvement uh, because there were no restrictions when I was when I was coming up. And I only say that to say to you that I know for sure I can work 40 hours in a row because I've done it. And I used to say stupid things like, I'll sleep when I die. I'm working. Well, what I didn't know then is that if I don't sleep, I will die because we know now from sleep science that it's so critical to health and longevity and injury prevention. Athletes who are unrecovered and not sleeping are more injured. And I believe it's critical for women in midlife because of the hormone fluctuations already going on in our brains, which are dependent on estrogen. So uh, I, I had a conversation with uh, uh, Kristen Holmes from Whoop, who I just adore. And we had this whole conversation about guidelines for sleep. And I was really thankful that I was doing mostly okay, but it also made me a little devastated about those nights where I only got five hours and 45 minutes. But basically you have a set sleep window. My set sleep window is I am in bed by 930 and I am up no later than five, even on the weekends, because what happens is during the day and sleep scientists out there, if I've gotten this wrong, you can correct me, but I don't think I'm wrong. During the day, we build up a chemical called adenosine, which we have a big pile of it in the morning, right? And then all day long, we use our adenosine until it's almost gone. And that's what triggers us to go to sleep, right? Because we're drowsy, the, the lowering of that well, if you mess up the window of adenosine, then we're not going to get the restorative sleep. Our, our, our body is expecting then to begin to be able to rejuvenate. So I protect that 930 to five is my sleep window, even on weekends. Something I also do to protect my sleep is I do not eat within three hours of my bedtime. So I eat a pretty early dinner. It's not very European of me to eat dinner no later than six o'clock, but, um, I don't want to be metabolically active while I'm trying to sleep, right? I don't want my gut to be churning away, which disturbs sleep. The other thing I don't, I've decided not to do, not because of my sleep, but thank goodness it also helps my sleep is um, I've never been a, a really comfortable drinker. I'm Asian. I don't have alcohol dehydrogenase. So I always got a little red and splotchy and unattractive when I was drinking. But what I know now is that it's a, uh, it's completely detrimental for aging and completely disturbs sleep. So you may pass out, but it's not deep sleep. It's just passing out. So those yeah. are my thoughts on sleep. I don't skip it. In fact, if I'm having a party or my teenager has people over, I like, I am out of here at nine 30. So yeah. let yourself. Up. Okay. I would like to end because I'm of course going to link everywhere. People can find you all your books, all the things Thank I you. would love it if you could tell us, because your Instagram page is phenomenal, three people on Instagram that people should pay attention to. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you. Well, you've probably already told people about Mary Claire, right? Everybody knows Mary Claire, who, who, you know, they, you know, she is like the, the biggest cheering section for all other women. So I'm just, I'm, I don't want to count her as one of my three. So <laughs> Mary Claire Haver, but other women I really love on Instagram. Um, I love Rachel Rubin. Yeah. She, she is just a spitfire. She has an office in, in DC, I think. I, I have so many more than three. I love Rachel Rubin. I love Kelly Casperson. We're like girlfriends. <laughs> And even though she lives on the other side of the country, I mean, I love, um, believe it or not, I love this woman called Trini Woodall. Have you ever oh, heard of Yes, Trini? I love Trini. Yes, I know I love Trini. Trini. I want you to come style for me. She just has this effervescence oh, and nonsense. Yes. I'm going to be fabulous yes. every minute. And I just love to watch her yes. joie de vivre, right? Yes. She's got this joy of life that... Yes that we should all have as we're living like this. I mean, there, there are dozens of other people I admire and I follow. I mean, there's lots of trainers I love, but um, yeah, I love that question. I mean, some of the people I love are not at all in medicine on Instagram. Which I think, I, actually, I love it that you answered it that way. I just feel like this community, the which is what we all are, is um, we're bettered by what we consume on, in social media. And so I, I love that. I and I appreciate that. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. I know you are a busy woman and I really appreciate it. And I appreciate it. The, the response when I said that I was going to be talking to you was overwhelming because you're clearly loved. So Aww. I really, really appreciate your time today. And I hope you have a really great rest of your week. Thank you so much for having me. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, you guys, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you have any questions, just leave them down below. I'll do my best to follow up. She is a busy, busy lady. I am telling you, you got to follow her because she's on Instagram. She's all over the place doing these interviews, spreading the word. She does midlife retreats. She was on the cruise when I went on the pause life cruise in January. She was there. I got to meet her in person. She's just an absolutely lovely person. Follow her over on Instagram. So much good content, good inspiration. You will love her content over there. I'm going to link all of it down below, of course. And I hope this was helpful. And I will talk to you in my next skincare video. Take care.